Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Jesse Valencia. He was a lovable and popular college student who in the mid-2000s was enjoying his time at university. However, when Jesse was suddenly found dead, a homicide investigation was launched by the police and they very quickly identified a number of potential suspects in the case. But as it turned out, the real killer was someone that they least expected. But quickly before we get into the case, I would like to say a big thank you to Babbel for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now for those of you that have never heard of Babbel before, it is a language learning app and there is such a huge variety of languages that you can learn on there. There's French, German, Italian, Swedish, Russian and so many more. And the language that I have just started learning on Babbel is Spanish. It has always been one of my goals to learn Spanish because it is obviously the official language of so many countries, I think like 21 countries. So I have just started studying it and I am really enjoying it so far. The thing I love about Babbel is the fact that they teach you the language in so many different ways. They'll teach you through lessons and games and podcasts, videos. They also offer live classes with top language teachers. You can constantly switch up how you learn so you don't get bored of just following one method. The lessons themselves are also short. They are like 10 minutes long which I find is just perfect for me because it means that even when I've got a really really busy day I can still find 10 minutes to squeeze in one lesson and keep up with my learning. The lessons are designed by real language teachers and Babbel teaches you real world practical conversation. As I said I've only just started studying Spanish on there but I've already learned and picked up a couple of really useful phrases. For example I've just learned that hasta pronto means see you soon and como estas means how are you? And as the summer season is upon us, I think that now would be the perfect time to start learning a new language. I'm sure many of you have got some summer holidays booked. Maybe you are going on vacation to another country. So why not use Babbel to start learning that country's language? That way, when you arrive, you can actually speak to and have conversations with the people there. Yo soy Lucia Martinez. Yo soy Lucia Martinez. 8 out of 8. So if you would like to check out Babbel then you can click the link in my description box to get 65% off of your Babbel subscription. An incredible deal. Or you can scan the QR code that is on the screen right now. Once again a massive thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. So for this week's case, we are going back to the year 2004 in Colombia, which is a city in the state of Missouri in the US. Now, Colombia is pretty much known as being an area full of mainly college students. It's where the University of Missouri is located. Thousands and thousands of young people move to Colombia every single year as part of their studies. So the Colombia Police Department was used to dealing with crimes that for the most part were committed by students. Usually Usually more low-level crimes that happen at parties, you know, alcohol-related offences, drunken disorderly incidents, rowdy teenagers. It wasn't often at all that they were dealing with crimes of a violent nature, so like assaults and homicides. It was incredibly rare that they had a murder investigation on their hands, but then came the summer of 2004. On the 5th of June 2004, I'm unsure whether or not this was in the morning or the afternoon 
afternoon as different sources state different things. It may have been around midday, but sometime in the day on the 5th of June 2004, a group of college students were walking near the east campus area of the Missouri University campus along a row of apartment buildings when they made a truly devastating discovery. On the ground between two apartment buildings, they spotted someone, a person lying in the grass, and they weren't moving. Now, as this was a college town, I imagine initially they just assumed that this person had passed out. Maybe they had a bit too much to drink the night before and they didn't make it back to their apartment. They just fell asleep on the ground outside. However, as the group got closer, they realised that this person was actually covered in blood and they weren't breathing. They were dead. So immediately the police were called to the area and the scene was sectioned off for investigation. The body found on the ground was that of a young man. He was lying face up. He was pretty much naked. The only thing he had on was some blue boxer shorts. As I said, he was covered in blood. There was a lot of blood around his neck area, which of course seemed very suspicious. Although saying that, one of the very first things theories that the police came up with literally at the scene was that perhaps this young man, whoever he was, had died as the result of jumping off of the roof of one of the apartment buildings that he was found in between. Maybe he was drunk and he for some reason was up on the roof and he fell. Perhaps even in his drunken state he was trying to jump from one building to the next but he failed. Maybe this was just a tragic, tragic accident. However, on a closer inspection of the body they realised that that wasn't the case because it appeared as though this young man's throat had been cut. He had a really really big very deep wound to his neck which had been inflicted with a sharp serrated knife and later in his autopsy it was confirmed that this was his cause of death. He had been attacked with a knife and murdered and the knife wound to his neck was so deep that it almost hit his spine, although no knife, no murder weapon was found at the scene. But what was interesting to the police was that this young man didn't seem to have many defensive wounds on his body, which they would have expected to see, especially because he was killed with a knife. He did have some bruises on his body, so he had a big bruise across his breastbone by his shoulders, and there was also a bruise in the middle of his back, but he didn't really have any cuts or any Thing, which is very unusual for someone who is attacked with a knife that they won't have any cuts or slashes on their hands or on their arms from where they are trying to protect themselves. So that seemed pretty odd. However, the medical examiner was eventually able to come up with an explanation for this. They discovered that there were signs of hemorrhage on both this young man's windpipe and also there was hemorrhaging in his eyes, suggesting that he had been choked and deprived of oxygen until he was unconscious. So the coroner believed that the victim was probably unconscious when he was attacked with the knife, when his throat was cut. So that's why there were no self-defense injuries, because he obviously didn't know that it was going to happen. He was passed out when that injury was inflicted. And the autopsy placed this man's time of death in the early hours of the morning on the 5th of June. It most likely happened sometime between 3 a.m and 5am and the police did believe that the murder occurred in the spot where the victim was found or around that area because of blood that was on the grass. It wasn't like he was killed elsewhere and then his body was dumped there. He was attacked and murdered in the area where his body was discovered by that group of students later that same day in between those two apartment buildings. So as soon as the body was found and emergency services were called to the scene, one of the very first things the police needed to do was, of course, identify this young man, figure out who he was, and then hopefully from there they'll be able to work out who did this to him. Frustratingly, he didn't have anything on him that could have identified him. I mean, he was only wearing boxers at the time. He didn't have any pockets containing anything like a wallet or ID. So because of that, the police started just asking around to see if anyone knew who this young man might have been. I think 
by this point, this case had gained a lot of attention. There were a lot of people just hanging around near the crime scene trying to find out what was going on. So the officers were just asking these onlookers if they knew this victim, if they recognised him. And someone did. Someone told the officers that they thought the deceased was a young man named Jesse Valencia, who was just 23 years old. And it turns out that they were right. Eventually it was confirmed that the person who had been murdered was Jesse. So before we continue with the investigation, let me just tell you a little bit more about Jesse, about his background and the kind of person that he was. So Jesse Valencia was born on the 22nd of February 1981 and he was originally from the state of Kentucky. Jesse's mother was named Linda and I don't believe his biological father was really in the picture. I don't think Jesse had any contact with him. According to one source, Jesse had a stepfather named Loop Valencia. Linda started a relationship with him when Jesse was just a very young boy and they had two children together. They had two daughters and their names were Rachel and Maria. So Jesse was the oldest of three children. He had two little sisters. Jesse was described by his mother as being a very friendly person. Even when he was very little, he was the kind of kid that could always make friends really easily because he was just so fun to be around. He was very chatty he could always make people laugh, he always had a smile on his face. From a very very young age Jesse knew that he was gay and he actually came out to his mum Linda when he was just 10 years old and he got really emotional about this because I think he had always been extremely close with his mum and he was worried that telling her this would ruin that, that she wouldn't love him anymore. So when he did tell his mum he cried and he said that he was so scared that she was going to hate him but Linda was incredibly supportive and she said to Jesse that there was nothing he could ever do that would make her hate him. Being gay didn't at all make her love him any less. And after he had shifted that weight off of his shoulders, Jesse was so much more comfortable within himself and he carried on being that happy, smiley kid that he'd always been. In his teenage years, when Jesse was in high school, he decided that he wanted to try his hand at more modeling and so he did. He had some model shots taken and he seemed to really enjoy it so his family just assumed that that was what he was going to do with his life. He was going to be a model and I think initially that was Jesse's career plan however eventually he changed his mind. He didn't want to be a model anymore. He decided instead that he wanted to become a lawyer and by the sounds of it he definitely would have been capable of being a lawyer. His friends and family said that Jesse was a very argumentative kind of person. He was not afraid of confrontation. He was very good at debates and he was really passionate about fighting for and defending what he believed in. And so after high school, he moved from his hometown in Kentucky all the way to Columbia in Missouri. He became a pre-law student at the University of Missouri and he lived there. He lived alone in an apartment in an apartment building. Alongside his studies, he had gotten a part-time job at a motel nearby and he started making so many new friends. He had a really good social circle. College life seemed to be going really well for Jesse Valencia, which is why it was such a shock to his friends and family when in early June of 2004, he was found murdered. As far as anyone was aware, Jesse didn't have any known enemies. So who had done this to him and why? Why did someone want him dead? Well, that is, of course, what the police now had to figure out. As soon as Jesse's body was discovered, a murder inquiry was launched and the hunt was on to catch his killer and quickly before they potentially struck again. So one of the first things they did after identifying Jesse was search his apartment. As I said, he lived alone and his apartment was actually located very close to the crime scene. It was literally only like a block away. So they went into his apartment and they started 
looking around and collecting any potential evidence. They collected some cigarettes from his apartment. They took his phone so that they could go through his phone records. I believe they also found a used condom on the floor in his home. So that was collected as evidence just in case that possibly could have had some relevance to the case. And alongside this, other officers were also speaking to and taking statements from Jesse's neighbours, asking them if they had seen or heard anything on the night that Jesse was killed. And actually, one of them did. One of the neighbours did provide some information about something that he had heard. This neighbour said that that night he had been out drinking, he'd gotten pretty drunk, and he returned to his apartment at around 3am and he went straight to sleep. However, he wasn't asleep for very long before something woke him up. It was a load of noise coming from next door, coming from Jesse Valencia's apartment. He could just hear loads of shouting. It sounded like two people were having an argument and this was around like 4am time and this neighbour got so frustrated that he got out of bed and he started banging on Jesse's front door, basically telling whoever was inside to shut up and keep the noise down. And then this neighbour returned to his apartment and he went straight back to sleep. So as soon as the police heard about this shouting coming from Jesse's apartment, they began thinking that whoever he was shouting at, whoever he was arguing with, that they were probably his killer. So they needed to find out who that person was, who he had an argument with that night. And actually it wasn't long after receiving this information that the police identified their first suspect or person of interest in the case. Just hours after Jesse's body was found, the police actually noticed that there was a young man crying, very visibly upset, near the crime scene. He was one of the many onlookers. So the police spoke to this young man and what they discovered was that he was actually an ex-boyfriend of Jesse's. His name was Jack Barry and he said that he had literally just heard that Jesse was dead. His friend had contacted him and told him the news and he just couldn't believe it, he was heartbroken. Now, an ex-partner of the victim is obviously going to be someone that the police are going to want to look into further, just in case they could have been responsible. Maybe their relationship ended on bad terms and this was a crime of passion. So Jack was taken to a police station where he was interviewed and asked some questions about his and Jesse's relationship. Jack told the police that he and Jesse had been together for about two years and and they'd only decided to separate rather recently and I'm not entirely sure why, what the reason behind their breakup was. I think, to be honest, they had just grown apart over time. But it seemed as though out of the two of them, this kind of hit Jesse the hardest. He didn't really want the relationship to end. Jack told the police that Jesse was struggling to accept the fact that they were no longer together. Whereas Jack was ready to get on with his life. He was ready to move on and he kind of had I think he was seeing someone new. So police began thinking, was that a possible motive for murder? If Jack was trying to move on and Jesse wasn't happy about it, maybe it led to them having an argument in Jesse's apartment that night. And this argument ended with Jack killing his ex-boyfriend. So detectives asked Jack what he had been doing on the night of Jesse's death. And he said, that he was at home alone and he was sleeping. Which of course is not the best alibi for the police because it means that there is no one to back that up and so they couldn't rule him out. They had to keep looking into Jack Barry as a suspect. Now after going through Jesse's phone records, the detectives actually discovered that on the night of the murder, it was around 3.18 a.m., Jesse had tried to call his ex, Jack. However, I don't believe Jack picked up this call but Jack told the police that literally around this same time that he received the call he did hear a knock at his front door but he didn't answer it because it was so late and he just wanted to go to sleep so he ignored it but he did think at the time when he heard it that it might have been Jesse because he had received a call from him at the same time maybe Jesse was ringing Jack to ask him to let him in just as a side note I don't know if it was ever confirmed to have been Jesse that knocked on Jack's door that night or if it was someone else and I don't know why Jesse tried to call him and as you can imagine to the police it was all sounding 
a bit odd, a bit confusing. So they continued interviewing Jack. He was interviewed for a long time, actually, for hours and hours. And as the interview continued, Jack was just getting more and more upset. He actually said to the police that he felt some level of guilt that he didn't answer the door at 3am because if it was Jesse and he let him in then maybe that could have prevented the murder and in fairness Jack did seem very sincere the detectives did feel as though he was being honest he wasn't the killer and that he was so genuinely upset about Jesse's murder even though they were no longer a couple it was obvious that Jack still cared for Jesse so much so the new of his murder just completely broke him and so even though Jack didn't necessarily have the strongest alibi I think the detectives gut instincts were just telling them that he wasn't the one who did this he wasn't the perpetrator and they were right he wasn't Jack Barry was innocent they did ask Jack if he could think of anyone that might have wanted to do this to Jesse but he honestly couldn't he just couldn't understand why this had happened the police also began speaking speaking to other people in Jesse's life. They were going through his many, many friends, asking if they knew of anyone that the police might want to look into. And there was one person that I think quite a few people mentioned to the police. They said that a young man named Zev Vintuck might have been of interest, might be worth looking into a bit more. Zev was also a student, just like Jesse, and the two had known each other for only a couple of weeks, and they'd been just hanging out occasionally I think they'd become good friends although some of Jesse's other friends began to question whether or not he and Zev were starting to become more than that whether they were starting to see each other but at the same time there were also rumors that if they were seeing each other Zev wasn't totally comfortable with people knowing that because he wasn't very open about his sexuality there was speculation that he was struggling to kind of come to terms with it and and accept himself for who he was. And after Jesse's murder, there were also rumours circulating that Zev might have actually been in the area that night. His car might have been near the area where Jesse's body was found. So the police began investigating him as a potential suspect too. Zev was questioned by the police. He was asked about the nature of his relationship with Jesse and he actually claimed that they weren't even seeing each other. They weren't in any kind of romantic relationship. They were literally just friends. And Zev said that on the night of Jesse's murder, he was at home sleeping. His alibi was very similar to Jack Barry's. But unlike Jack Barry, Zev wasn't alone in his house that night. He lived with his parents. So the police spoke to his parents and they said that Zev was telling the truth. He was in the house all night. They actually said that if Zev had left the house that evening at any point, they would have known about it because to leave his house, he would have had to go through the garage door, which apparently always made a really, really loud noise noise when you opened it so they would have heard that if he left and they didn't so that was Zev kind of ruled out I don't think he was fully ruled out but for the time being that was enough for the police and they were going to keep looking into other people now as part of their investigation the police of course had the task of trying to piece together Jesse Valencia's last known movements they obviously knew that he was killed sometime between 3 to 5 a.m on the 5th of June most likely between 4 to 5 a.m. given the account from the neighbor. Remember he said that he heard shouting coming from Jesse's apartment around 4 a.m. so he was probably killed after that. So they knew that he had been murdered around that time frame in the early hours of the 5th but they wanted to find out what he had been doing the evening before this, the evening of the 4th of June. Where was he? Who was he with? After doing a bit of digging they discovered that that evening after finishing a shift at the motel where he worked part-time, Jesse actually went to a party that one of his friends was hosting at their house. He arrived at the party at approximately 11 p.m. He was having some drinks and he spent most of the evening hanging out with a guy named Ed McDevitt who was 22 years old. Ed and Jesse had very recently become friends. They had met literally just a few nights before this and they had started having a sexual relationship almost immediately. In fact, Ed's DNA was found 
found on the condom that the police collected from Jesse's apartment. It was from where they had slept together about two nights before Jesse's murder. Anyway, Ed and Jesse were at this party on the evening of the 4th slash the early hours of the 5th and then the two left the party together that night at around 3 a.m. and they began walking towards Jesse's apartment. So now the police had a third suspect in the case, Ed McDevitt. Could he have had anything to do with Jesse's murder since we know they were together shortly before Jesse was killed? So Ed was brought down to the police station to be questioned and he said that yes they were together that night, they were at the party together and they left together but he claimed that he didn't go back to Jesse's apartment with him, they started walking in that direction but then they said goodbye and Ed began walking back to his home but Ed said that they were on the phone to each other whilst they both walked back home alone and that was confirmed by the police when they checked Jesse's phone, it was found that he and Ed had been on the phone to each other around 3.13am. So that was Ed's story, they left the party together but that they went their separate ways shortly after and the last time he saw Jesse he was alive. But of course the police couldn't just take Ed's word for it, they had to confirm this and they soon did. They spoke to Ed's roommate who said that they were still awake when Ed returned home that night and he did come back the time that he said he did before it's believed Jesse was killed. His alibi seemed to check out so that was yet another potential suspect that had reached a dead end. The investigators didn't have any concrete evidence linking any of their three people of interest to the crime, but the police were hoping that maybe DNA testing might help them get closer to identifying the killer. Now in Jesse's autopsy, obviously different swabs and samples were taken from his body and they were submitted for DNA testing. So for example, fingernail scrapings were taken and they were sent off for testing and as well as that some hairs were sent off. Authorities actually discovered hairs on Jesse's chest that were not a match to his hair. They could actually tell that these hairs had come from a limb so they were either leg or arm hairs and like I said they weren't Jesse's so the police believed that they were the killers and so they were collected and sent to the lab. So scientists got straight to work on that on conducting DNA tests and meanwhile other officers were still carrying out other lines of inquiry. They were still speaking to everyone that Jesse knew, all of his friends, and it was after they spoke to one friend of his in particular that they identified yet another potential person of interest. This friend was named Andy, he was also a college student just like Jesse and as well as being friends the two of them had a sexual relationship. They weren't a couple or anything, it was more like a friends with benefits type situation. Now Andy couldn't have had anything to do with Jesse's murder because it turns out that he wasn't even in the area on the night that it happened and the police could confirm that. However Andy did provide the police with some information information that he thought may have possibly been relevant to the case. Andy said that he knew of another man that Jesse was sleeping with occasionally in the lead up to his death and he said that that man was actually a police officer an officer that worked for the Columbia Police Department. The very same police department that was dealing with this investigation. And the reason he knew this was because on the 14th of May 2004, so about three weeks before Jesse's murder, Andy was at Jesse's apartment, the two of them were sleeping together, and during this there was a knock at the door just in the middle of the night. So Jesse got out of bed and he opened the door and Andy noticed that it was a police officer. He was in his uniform and everything and Jesse let him in. And Andy was just quite confused, he didn't understand why there was an officer at the door and I think he looked at Jesse with a confused look on his face and Jesse just said something along the lines of, oh don't worry he's cool, he's cool. And then the officer told Jesse and Andy to just carry on with what they were doing and then he proceeded to remove his clothes and he joined Andy and Jesse 
in bed. All three of them slept together. And then Andy said that afterwards, the officer got up, he put his clothes straight back on, and he said to Andy and Jesse that they couldn't tell anyone about what had just happened. It had to be kept a secret. And then just as he was leaving, Jesse said to the officer, well, when will I see you again? And the officer replied saying, you'll see me when you see me. And with that, he walked out of the apartment. So it was clear to Andy from this encounter that Jesse knew this officer. They had known each other beforehand and had probably been sleeping together for a while, but clearly it was something that this officer wanted to keep quiet. And when the detectives investigating Jesse's murder heard about this from Andy, they just couldn't believe it. They were completely shocked and also just really confused because if what Andy was saying was true, then why hadn't they heard about it from this officer? Why hadn't he come forward? He would have known that the detectives would have been wanting to speak to everyone that Jesse knew as part of their inquiries. So why hadn't he said anything? Was it maybe because he was involved in this. Detectives started thinking, is there a chance that one of their own could have been the killer? So once they heard this story from Jesse's friend Andy, the next step was to obviously identify who this police officer was. Unfortunately, Andy didn't know his name. He only met him that one time and he didn't find out his name, but he did say that he remembered what he looked like. He would be able to recognize him if he saw his face again. So detectives walked Andy to another room in the police station where they had this book full of pictures of the Columbia Police Department officers. They wanted him to look through it and pick out the officer that came to Jesse's apartment that night. However, Andy didn't even have to look through the book. It turns out that as he was walking with detectives through the station to that room, he actually passed the officer. And he told the detectives that. He said, I literally just passed him in the hallway. The officer that he passed was named Stephen Rios and he was 27 years old. So just for a bit of background information on him, Stephen Rios had worked for the Columbia Police Department for about three years by this point. He was a patrol officer, I think. And to be honest, the people who worked with him, his colleagues, only ever had good things to say about him. They all thought that he was very good at his job. He was passionate about it. He was ambitious. He was very well respected. As for his personal life, he was a husband, he was married to a woman and they had a child together, a son, who was only a few months old when this case took place. To everyone around him, Stephen Rio seemed like a very normal, admirable guy. So it was really hard for the detectives to believe that he could have been capable of committing such a brutal murder. But of course, after finding out this information from Andy, they had to look into the possibility that maybe he was. Now, by the time Stephen Rios was identified as a potential suspect, he was actually out of town. I believe he'd gone on a camping trip with a couple of his colleagues just for a short while. So whilst he was gone, the detectives decided that they were going to try and piece together Stephen's movements from the day that Jesse's body was discovered. And what they found out was that he was actually at the scene that day as an officer. His shift began in the afternoon and after Jesse's body was found, Stephen told the sergeant that he was going to go to the scene to see if he could help in any way. And I mean, if he was the killer, how creepy is that? The fact that he wanted to be at the scene. He wanted to overlook everything that was going on. And actually, shortly after Jesse was identified as being the murder victim, Stephen Rios did tell his fellow police officers that he had met Jesse Valencia before. He said that he'd met Jesse a couple of months earlier on the 18th of April, 2004. That day, Jesse was at a party at a friend's house and the party was very noisy and very loud. And so I think one of the neighbors contacted the police and complained. And so the police arrived at the house to try and get the party guests to keep the noise down. And one of the officers that went to the scene was Stephen Rios. However, Jesse was being a little bit argumentative with the police officers. He obviously was a law student, so he was being a bit cocky and he was saying things like, what's your probable cause? I imagine he was probably a little bit drunk and because he was so argumentative, 
with the officers actually arrested him. Stephen Rios arrested him and he gave him a municipal court summons for quote, obstructing a governmental operation. So that is how the two, Stephen and Jesse, met. But that was all that Stephen said about it. He never mentioned them ever having a relationship beyond that. And yet Jesse's friend Andy claimed that they did. He claimed that they had slept together. And when the police spoke to Jesse's family, specifically his mother Linda, she said that she did actually recall her son mentioning the police officer that had arrested him before. Linda didn't know the officer's name. Some sources state that even Jesse didn't know his real name. Of course, we know that it was Stephen. But Jesse told his mum that the cop who arrested him on the 18th of April was really, really nice and talkative. And he seemed to be very interested in Jesse. He was asking him lots of different questions about him and his life. And Jesse also told his mum that just the following day, that same officer turned up at his apartment just completely out of the blue. The officer, Stephen, claimed that he just needed to speak to Jesse a bit further about the incident that happened the night before at the party. He needed to answer a few more questions. Although he actually didn't really ask any questions about the party. He was, again, just asking Jesse even more questions about his life, very personal questions. He clearly wanted to know more about Jesse Valencia. And Linda told the detectives that the two of them stayed in contact even after that. They went out together on a couple of occasions and they started hanging out at Jesse's apartment. This officer would just turn up at Jesse's apartment with no warning beforehand, usually just in the middle of the night. But as it turns out, Jesse's mum Linda and his friend Andy weren't the only people with information about this police officer. Another one of Jesse's friends named Joan had some pretty interesting information to offer too. She told detectives that Jesse had also told her about this police officer that he had been spending time with. He told her that he would drop by Jesse's apartment in the middle of the night, usually in the early hours of the morning, and that they would sleep together and then the officer would just get up and leave. And Joan did actually meet the officer. She was at Jesse's apartment one night when he turned up just unannounced and when the detectives showed her a picture of Stephen Rios in a photo lineup she immediately said that's him that's the guy that I saw that night. So now three separate people in Jesse's life had told detectives pretty much the same story about this police officer that Jesse had been seeing and two of these people Andy and Joan had literally identified Stephen Rios as being that police officer. Evidence was mounting against Stephen, not necessarily evidence that he was the killer, but evidence that he was having a secret relationship with the victim in the lead up to their death, and he hadn't been forthcoming about it. Although, saying that, as the detectives continued speaking to Jesse's friend Joan, they did actually identify a possible motive that Stephen Rios might have had for wanting Jesse dead. Now, as I said, after being arrested at that party in April, Jesse was given a court summons by Rios for obstructing a governmental operation. However, because after this, Jesse and Stephen started sleeping together occasionally, Jesse had assumed that the whole court business thing wouldn't go any further. He thought that the charge would have been dismissed, but it turns out that it hadn't been. Jesse was still going to have to go to court, and he was really frustrated about this, and quite angry that Stephen hadn't dismissed it. And he told his friend Joan this, that he was angry at Stephen. And in the lead up to his death, Jesse told Joan that the next time Stephen came over to his apartment, he was essentially going to threaten him and tell him that he was going to tell his boss, the Columbia police chief, that Rios was sleeping with Jesse, sleeping with someone that he had arrested and charged with an offence. And I guess Rios could have gotten in big trouble for that. So perhaps he decided to kill Jesse 
before he could follow through with his threats. Maybe there was more to it than that though. I mean, we know that Stephen was married. He was married to a woman and they had a son together and his wife had no idea that he was cheating on her, cheating on her with anyone, let alone with a man. Maybe Stephen Rios was struggling with his sexuality. He felt ashamed of it, which is why he would only visit Jesse in the middle of the night to sleep with him so that he could keep it a secret. So Stephen Rios did have a pretty strong motive for wanting Jesse dead. This secret that Jesse was threatening to expose would have turned Stephen's world completely upside down should it get out. It would affect his work life, his career would have been in jeopardy, his marriage would have been at risk, his wife probably would have left him, and he would have had to deal with everyone finding out that the person he was cheating on his wife with was a man, a college student. So after learning all of this from Joan and Andy and Jesse's mum Linda, Stephen Rios pretty much became the top suspect in the case. Now before they did anything, before they arrested or questioned Stephen, the detectives had decided that they just wanted to keep working on their case against him for the time being because it is a difficult thing to accuse one of your own, especially when you don't really have much evidence against them. They basically wanted to wait for the results from the science lab to come back, the DNA test, before they did anything. But that didn't really happen because because before they got the results, Stephen Rios himself actually came forward to the police finally and he said that he wanted to talk to the detectives that were investigating this case, Jesse's case. And I imagine the detectives at this point might have been thinking, oh my god, is he going to confess? Is this going to be a confession? However, they soon realised that no, it wasn't. Rios sat down with the detectives and he said that he had heard from a few people that there was a rumour going around that the murder victim, Jesse Valencia, was having an affair with a Columbia police officer. And he basically just wanted to reiterate to the detectives that he did know Jesse because he had arrested him that one time and issued him with a court summons. But he said that that was it. That was the... I guess, extent of their relationship. He was trying to cover himself, basically, trying to throw the police off of his scent. But of course, what he didn't know was that the police already had all these other statements from multiple people in Jesse's life that pretty much proved that Rios was the officer that Jesse was sleeping with. And so the detectives said that to him. They said, look, Stephen, we've been told different. We've been informed by one of Jesse's female friends that she was over at Jesse's apartment one evening when you just turned up out of the blue. And upon hearing this, Stephen changed his story. He said, okay, yeah, after me and Jesse met in April, we had started getting to know each other and we became friends. But he was insistent that that was it. They were literally just friends. They'd never had sex or had any kind of romantic relationship. And so the detectives confronted him with the statement they had from Andy. They said, said, well, we've spoken to another one of Jesse's friends, a male friend, and he said that he was actually at Jesse's apartment one night, they were sleeping together, when all of a sudden, you knocked on the door and joined in. And Rios seemed to get very defensive of this. He was clearly very, very uncomfortable. And I think at first he basically said that that was a lie. The person who made that statement was a liar. However, eventually when he could tell that the detectives didn't believe him, they weren't falling for it, he changed his story yet again. And he admitted that, yes, he and Jesse Valencia had slept together before. Initially, he said that they had only done it once, but then he changed again and he said that it happened around six times. But despite finally admitting this, he was adamant that he had absolutely nothing to do with Jesse's death. He was not the killer. So the police asked Stephen for an account of his movements on the night that Jesse he died. Now he said that he was working that night till around 3am and then after his shift ended he went out with a couple of his 
colleagues, his fellow police officers, and they went and had a few drinks together on the rooftop of a parking garage nearby. He said that he hung out with them for a few hours and then when he left he went straight back home and he arrived back at his house sometime around 5.15 to 5.30 in the morning. Now after he gave this account, Stephen Rios was free to go. They didn't arrest him or anything because at this point in time they didn't have any solid concrete evidence to be able to charge him with anything. So he was let go but now that they had his version of events from that night, the detectives were going to go through it meticulously and see if he was telling the truth about his movements or if they could catch him out. After speaking to his wife, she confirmed that Stephen did get home that night at the time that he said, around like 5.15, 5.30 a.m. And the detectives also spoke to the officers that he was with that night and they also confirmed his story. They said that they finished their shifts at three in the morning and then they all went out and had a couple of drinks together. However, what's interesting is that when the police checked the security door records from the place where they went that night, the rooftop of that parking garage, they were able to determine that Stephen Rios left the garage at 4.37 a.m. Now the journey from the garage to his home was less than four minutes long. It would have taken him minutes to drive home and yet Stephen and his wife said that he arrived back to his house sometime after 5.15 but he left the roof at 4.00 37 so that's at least 38 minutes of time unaccounted for possibly even more because remember his wife said that he got home sometime between 5 15 to 5 30 and the journey from Stephen's house to Jesse's apartment was about 10 minutes long so he had the opportunity he had the time to go to Jesse's apartment that night and kill him. In an attempt to find more evidence, Stephen's house was searched by the police to see if they could find anything in there that linked him to the crime, but unfortunately they didn't really. They also conducted searches of his car and his locker at work was searched, but again, nothing incriminating was found. But they weren't giving up. They were, I think, convinced by this point that they had the right guy. As much as they probably didn't want to believe it because he was a fellow police officer, the detectives were sure that Stephen was the perpetrator and Stephen clearly knew this. He knew that the police believed he was guilty and so he was actually prepared to just end it all. One day, one of the Columbia police detectives received a phone call from Stephen Rios, a very distressing phone call. Stephen was crying, he was hysterical on this phone call, and he just said to the detective, quote, I've done a bad thing. After being asked where he was, what he was doing, Stephen said that he was a couple of hours away from Columbia in Kansas City, and he said that he was armed with a gun. It seemed as though Stephen intended to commit suicide, probably so that he wouldn't have to deal with the consequences of what he had done. Thankfully, the detective managed to convince Stephen on the phone to just drive back home, back to Columbia, so that they could sort all of this out. And as soon as he returned, he was actually committed to a mental health care facility, and he was put on a 96-hour hold and monitored so that he wouldn't kill himself. However, he wasn't there for very long. Somehow, he managed to literally escape the facility, and as soon as he did, he went straight to the roof of a parking garage, possibly the same parking garage that he was at when he was drinking with his colleagues on the night of the murder, I'm not sure. Anyway, he went to the roof of the garage and he intended to jump off. He really was going to end his life. As soon as the police heard about his escape, they began trying to track him down and they did quickly find him on the roof and they were obviously trying to talk him down, talk him out of committing suicide and this gained a lot of attention from the public. This happened around 7 p.m. one evening, I believe just a couple of days after Jesse's murder. This investigation was moving very quickly and while Stephen was on the roof and the police were trying to cool him down, there were a load of people outside just watching this happen. A whole crowd of people watching this unfold, waiting to see if Stephen really would jump. Luckily, once again, the detectives were successful 
successfully able to convince Rios not to take his own life. After about three quarters of an hour, he agreed to come down off the roof. And once he did, he was, of course, again put into the psychiatric facility and he was placed under suicide watch. And in the meantime, the police were going to continue trying to find more evidence and build their case against him because they still didn't necessarily have that solid evidence that they needed to, to prove that he was the killer. That was until about three weeks after Jesse's death when detectives had the breakthrough that they had been waiting for. The DNA tests had come back. Now if you recall from earlier on in the video we talked about how when Jesse's body was found scientists took some nail samples from him and they found DNA underneath his fingernails and when tested it was found that some of this DNA was a match to Stephen Rios. We also discussed how forensics collected some hairs from Jesse's chest that weren't his, they weren't a match to his hair so the police believed that they were the killers and when tested it was determined that these hairs were a match to the main suspect Stephen Rios. Now as I mentioned earlier the hairs on Jesse's chest were limb hairs, they had come from either Stephen's legs or his arms and after the match was made the detectives realised something. They realised that, that obviously being a police officer, Stephen Rios would have known how to carry out a chokehold. So they began thinking maybe he did that to Jesse on the night that he died. He put him in a chokehold to try and control him. He put his arm around Jesse's neck and there was a struggle and that's how Stephen's arm has ended up on Jesse's chest, perhaps from where Jesse was trying to pull at his arms to free him if Jesse was put in a chokehold that could also explain the bruises that he had on his body remember he had a bruise in the middle of his back and a big bruise across his chest by his shoulder bone perhaps he sustained those bruises from being held in the chokehold another thing that the chokehold theory would explain is the fact that if you remember it was determined in his autopsy that Jesse was unconscious when his throat was cut with the knife because if correctly a chokehold can render someone unconscious in literally seconds so maybe the chokehold knocked him out and that's when Stephen attacked him with the knife so it was all starting to add up now it was all starting to make sense to the police and now that they had the DNA evidence linking Stephen Rios to the crime the police finally felt as though they had obtained enough evidence to both arrest and charge him with Jesse's murder and so that's exactly exactly what they did on the 1st of July 2004, just under a month after the crime took place. He was charged with murder in the first degree, but despite the evidence against him, Stephen Rio still maintained his innocence. And so when it came to his trial, he decided to plead not guilty. During the trial, the prosecution went through their account of what they believed happened on the night that Jesse Valencia died, based on the facts and the evidence that the police had collected. On that fateful night on the 5th of June 2004 after Stephen's shift ended and he finished drinking with his colleagues the prosecution believed that he went straight to his secret lover Jesse Valencia's apartment hoping that the two of them would sleep together. However when he arrived Jesse was not willing to do that. He was angry at Stephen because of what we spoke about earlier. The fact that he hadn't dismissed the court summons that had been handed to Jesse. Some sources also state that Jesse was angry with Rios because he had also very recently learned that he was married and he had a kid, something Stephen conveniently hadn't told him. And Jesse didn't feel comfortable with this, obviously. He knew that it was wrong. So that night, Jesse confronted Stephen about all of the lies that he had told and he said to him that he was going to get in touch with the police chief and tell them about the fact that they had been sleeping together. So the two of them got into a very heated argument. They started shouting at one another and it's theorised that that was obviously the argument that the neighbour heard that night. It's believed that when Jesse threatened to tell the chief that Rios started to panic, he knew the repercussions of his actions. He knew what would happen if this affair 
got exposed, his job would be at risk. He would be at risk of losing his family. He could not let this get out. So he decided in that moment that he needed to silence Jesse Valencia. And to do that, he was going to kill him. It's believed that Rios started to attack Jesse inside of his apartment. He started to get aggressive and violent. And so Jesse, probably very scared, opened the door and he ran out of the apartment building wearing just his boxers. But Stephen Rios followed him. He chased after Jesse and he quickly caught up to him as Jesse was running along the grass between those two apartment buildings. I imagine Jesse was a little drunk after having been to that party at his friend's house that night and so he sadly wasn't able to run as fast as he probably would have been able to had he been sober. When he caught up to him, Stephen grabbed Jesse from behind and began trying to restrain him using the chokehold and it's speculated that Stephen actually struggled to do this at first. Obviously being a police officer he had received training on how to do this. He had done a defensive tactics course before but it turns out that he failed this course so he knew from the training how to do a chokehold but he wasn't the best at it and so it's believed that that's actually why there was a lot of bruising on Jesse's body because Stephen was struggling to administer the chokehold and as he was trying to do it and render Jesse unconscious Jesse was trying to fight back there was a violent struggle between them which caused the bruises on his body unfortunately eventually Jesse did pass out from the chokehold and once he was unconscious and on the ground Stephen got out a knife which I assume he just had in his pocket and using it he cut Jesse's throat so that he would bleed out and die and then he just left he left the scene and Jesse's body was found by those college students hours later and that was the prosecution's version of events of course the defense Stephen's side tried Tried to refute this. They stuck to Stephen's story that yes, he had slept with Jesse, but he didn't kill him. By the sounds of it, the defense were actually trying to in a way, blame Jesse for his own murder. They used smear tactics and tried to damage his reputation and destroy his character. They basically said that Jesse was big-headed and he was loud and volatile and that he was the type to sleep with so many different men and that any one of those men could have been Jesse's killer because it was not Stephen Rios. Anyway, at the end of the trial, the jury went off to deliberate. They deliberated for about eight hours in total and when they returned to the courtroom they announced that they ultimately agreed with the prosecution and had found Stephen Rios guilty of first degree murder. Now that was in May of 2005 so less than a year after Jesse was killed. However according to a couple of sources Rios quickly appealed his conviction and it worked. It was actually overturned by the Missouri Court of Appeals Western District. And the reason for this was because of, quote, hearsay statements that were ruled inadmissible in court. So that meant that there had to be another trial, a retrial, and that took place four years after the murder in 2008. Stephen Rios once again pleaded his innocence, but the evidence against him proved to the new jury that he was in fact guilty of of this crime. Although, according to sources, in his second trial, he was found guilty of second degree murder, not first degree. I'm not entirely sure why perhaps they concluded that this murder wasn't necessarily premeditated. It is believed that he went to Jesse's apartment that night for sex. He didn't go to kill him. He only decided to kill Jesse when he threatened to expose the affair. But anyway, Stephen was found guilty of second degree murder and also for armed criminal action and he was sentenced to life in prison. And on top of that, he also received a 23 year sentence for the armed criminal action charge. I think it's probably very unlikely that he will ever be released from prison but according to one article he will be eligible for parole in 2049. But that is it for this case. That is the case of 23 year old Jesse Valencia. A very sad case and an especially terrifying one as well. The fact that the killer was a police officer. The killer was someone that you're supposed to trust that is supposed to keep you safe. I would love to hear what you guys think about this case so as always do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments. 
Also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Again, you can let me know in the comments or alternatively, I do have a case request form linked in the description box of all of my videos. But yeah, thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next time for another mystery with Molly. Bye.